welcome to Word Magazine number 167. This is Pastor Jeff Riddle from Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. Today is Tuesday, June the 30th of 2020. In this episode, I want to address the question, why do Muslim apologists love the modern critical text of the Bible and those who promote it? I want to approach this topic by playing two short clips of recent statements made by prominent Muslim apologists. Those of us who defend the traditional text of Scripture have often been accused, especially as many know by one uh, popular internet apologist in particular, of having absolutely no meaningful apologetic. We are told that we cannot use our approach to the defense of the Texas Receptus in the so-called real world. Uh, We cannot meaningfully speak with non-Christians, with atheists, and especially with Muslims. Uh, We can't have any dialogue or conversation. We can't do evangelism with them unless we embrace the vaunted modern approach to text criticism. We are told that the only way to do this sort of evangelism or apologetics is that we must teach, we must instruct the Muslims that the text of the Bible, though it has been corrupted, we must concede that, it can be through the miracle of modern scientific text criticism, it can be reconstructed, and we can get a very close approximation to the text despite its past corruptions, and that despite these things, the, the, the Bible is still inspired, it's still trustworthy, it still um, can be read, and it still has authority despite these corruptions. And we must take this approach, only this approach will work, and then we will be able to supposedly convince the Muslims to come over to our enlightenment type view of what the scriptures are about, and they will abandon the Quran, they will abandon Islam once uh, the, uh, the, the switch is flipped and they see this, uh, this modern enlightenment view of our religious text. Defenders of the Texas Receptus, however, have have pointed out that such an approach is, in fact, a complete capitulation to Muslims who gleefully embrace scholarly rejections of the Bible's textual integrity, and they also gleefully embrace uh, modern scholars who profess abandonment of the traditional doctrine of the providential preservation of the text of Scripture as it is laid out prominently in Reformed confessions like the Westminster Confession of Faith and my own Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. We all know that there is one apologist in particular who quite frequently humble brags or humble boasts about being invited to give presentations on the text of the Bible before Muslim audiences and with prominent Muslim apologists and even within Muslim mosques. He's asked to give these presentations where he concedes the textual corruption of the Bible and pontificates again about how valuable the modern critical text method is. And he sees this as a fantastic advancement that he has made. See how trustworthy he is? He never seems, however, to stop and wonder why it is that Muslims are so eager to have him dialogue uh, with them, or why they so often post extended clips of his teachings, not taken out of context, but given in full context on their own apologetic social media sites. Why is that? It's such a curiosity. Along these lines, I would commend to you the recent Confessional Bibliology Roundtable number three that was done on May the 26th of this year. 
Uh, I was happy to be a part of that series. We did three roundtables. Uh, my, my friend uh, Christian McShaffrey did the first one of these on John 1.18. I did the second one on 1 John 5, 7, and 8. And then the third one was Pastor Puyan Mershai from uh, Cheltenham, England, a Reformed Baptist pastor there. And he did a presentation on the Texas Receptus and apologetics, and in particular, in using the received or traditional text in doing evangelism and apologetics with Muslims or those with a Muslim background. And the interesting thing, of course, is that Pastor Puyan is Iranian himself. Uh, he, he knows very well um, those who come from a Muslim background, and he's in the trenches uh, doing uh, Bible studies, doing outreach, doing evangelism with all kinds of people, but especially with um, those with a Muslim background. He has a ministry to those who are Farsi-speaking people. And he did a beautiful job in that presentation explaining that it is, the, in fact, the traditional text that is most useful in doing evangelism and apologetics with non-believers, and especially those who come from Muslim backgrounds. One of the things that stood out in that presentation was that Pastor Puyan noted that back in Iran, uh, I forget the exact title of the government office, but they have something like a ministry of religion in Iran, and he uh, noted the fact that uh, this government agency in Iran is actively involved in translating scholarly materials from the West, including even works of prominent evangelicals on the text of the Bible. Why are they doing this? Why do they want to promote and make this available to uh, their own citizens? It isn't because they have some kind of enlightenment interest in understanding um, modern approaches, Christian approaches to the Bible. It's not because they want to promote Christianity, but they are actively translating these works into Farsi and disseminating them because they realize that from their perspective, it undermines the validity of Christianity and furthers the Muslim narrative of the hopeless corruption of the scriptures. This is why now, Muslims reject what the Gospels say about Jesus, and they reject basic things like uh, the fact that Jesus was crucified um, or that Jesus claimed uh, to be God. John 10, 30, I and the Father, we are one. Uh, they can deny Thomas's declaration, uh, my Lord and my God, because they can say the text has been corrupted. And they're promoting these works. And I think it was, a, it was a great point to understand, to get a, an accurate understanding of what's really at stake with respect to apologetics and which text is most useful in doing apologetics. So uh, without any further ado, let's move on to the first of two clips, brief clips that I want to share. The first one was sent to me a couple of months ago, and as I noted in the last Word magazine, I kind of uh, got off track there for a little while and haven't done uh, many of these Word magazines. I'm trying to get back on track. But anyway, a couple of months ago, someone sent this to me, and it's a video uh, that comes from a pretty prominent Muslim apologist named Adnan Rashid. And this was posted to YouTube back on April the 17th of this year, 2020. And it was a video that was a response to another evangelical Christian apologist named David Wood. It's titled, Will David Wood Accept Islam? And by the way, I'll do a blog post to uh, my uh, blog article to my uh, um, blog, which is jeffriddle.net, in which I will have links not only to the Confessional Bibliology Roundtable number three that I mentioned earlier with Puyan, but to both of the clips that I'm going to be showing along with some notes uh, from this presentation. But anyways, um, so this was a longer conversation in which 
Rashid was responding to David Wood, and I won't get into trying to analyze David Wood or his approach doing apologetics, um, but uh, they were, they were, Adnan Rashid was basically attacking Wood and telling him that the, that, that, the, that the Bible doesn't provide any unequivocal statements supporting core Christian doctrines like the Trinity and the doctrine of Christ. And towards the end of this video, though, uh, Rashid um, spends some time talking about his view of the textual corruption of the New Testament. And where does he go to support his views? He goes to the writings of Christian scholars. He goes to Bruce Metzger, he goes to Bart Ehrman, and even, as we'll see, to Michael J. Kruger. So let me just go ahead and play uh, this um, clip from uh, Adnan Rashid. So we're gonna start at about the 15 minute and 22 second mark in this presentation. So this is Mr. Rashid. The point I want to make is, do we need the Quran to believe that the New Testament has been changed, altered, or corrupted? Do we need the Quran for that? Absolutely not, no. We need the Christians to tell us that and the Christians have told us that this is a book in front of you title the text of the New Testament its transmission corruption and restoration yeah so we don't need the Quran to tell us the Bible is corrupted he says we just need the writings of Christians and he pulls his the most recent edition of um, Bruce Metzger's book on the the on text criticism with its subtitle, The Transmission, Corruption, and Restoration of the Bible. Of course, what the Muslim hears is the Bible is corrupted. So we'll let him continue. Fourth edition by Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger is the author of this particular book. Bruce Metzger, by the way, died a Christian. Having believed that the text of the New Testament was transmitted, it was corrupted, and then it was allegedly restored. And who restores it? Who restored the text of the New Testament after it was completely corrupted beyond repair? This is another work by Bruce Metzger titled A, text, a Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament, second edition, Bruce Metzger. On page 11 of the introduction, Actually, page 10 of the introduction, it states, of the approximately 5,000 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that are known today, no two agree exactly in all particulars. Confronted by a mass of conflicting, conflicting readings, editors must decide which variants deserve to be included in the text and which should be relegated to the apparatus. In other words, Bruce Metzger is saying that the editors today in the 21st century decide as to what may go to the text of the New Testament. Men in the 21st century decide choosing from thousands of variant readings of the New Testament as to what may be included in the text. Although... So he's pointing out the fact that, yes, in the, in the 21st century, there are modern text critics who say the Bible has been corrupted. We, we haven't had it. It's been hopelessly lost, but we're going to attempt to reconstruct the original. And, of course, this was the approach of Metzger and others in the, in, uh, the 20th century and reaching back to the 19th century. And, of course, it is an abandonment of the idea uh, that the text of Scripture has been providentially preserved. And what is the Muslim apologist doing? Uh, he's making hay with this. And he's uh, taking this approach to prove to his listeners apologetically that the Bible is corrupt and therefore they should trust the Koran, which has been providentially preserved, again, according to their view. Uh, he's going to uh, provide some more quotations from his beloved Metzger. And I continue... Although at first it may seem to be a hopeless task amid so many thousands of variant readings to sort out those that should be regarded as original, textual scholars have developed certain generally acknowledged criteria of evaluation. 
these considerations depend, it will be seen upon probabilities. And sometimes the textual critic must weigh one set of probabilities against another. In other words, Bruce Metzger is saying here that set of probabilities are put against each other to determine as to what may be the original text of the New Testament. He put, if you watch the video, he's sitting outside, by the way, while he's doing this, and the, the, the vehicle passing by was in his background, not in mine as I'm recording this. But when he said the word, the original, he put up scare quotes. And again, he's pillaring. He's, he's making fun of the idea that scholars can sort through the available empirical evidence and reconstruct the original. Um, so, anyways, he's, he's pillaring the idea. In other words, the word of God. How can scholars in the 21st century, sitting around global libraries, decide as to what may be the original writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and by extension, the word of God, as the Christians believe? Another very powerful book I strongly recommend before I go is The Early Text of the New Testament. In the very introduction of this book, scholars state, scholars like Charles E. Hill and Michael J. Kruger, they insist that the quest for the so-called original text is almost over because now the scholars are even questioning the meaning of the word or the term original text. Okay, here he takes, again, the, the book, which is an excellent book, actually, from Oxford University Press by Charles Hill and... Michael J. Kruger, they were the editors of it, and he's cognizant of the fact that there has been a shift in text criticism, although people like Tommy Wasserman and, and um, Peter Gurry keep telling me, no, 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 there hasn't been a shift, there hasn't been a shift, but here's a Muslim apologist who says, hey, I've read this book, and these scholars are saying there's now been a shift so that now even the Christian scholars are saying it's hopeless to try to reconstruct the original. We're not even attempting to reconstruct the original even more. So uh, not only is some, someone like Rashid making hay of the old modern textual critical method, now he's making hay with the new postmodern uh, critical text approach to the New Testament. So how do the Christian missionaries like David Wood and others respond? They respond by attacking the Prophet. They respond by attacking the Quran. They respond by mocking the Muslims. This is All right, I'm going to just stop there. He, he goes on and talks a little bit more, but I think we've proven the point um, of showing, demonstrating the ways in which Muslim apologists make use of modern text criticism and those who advocate for it. So I want to move on now to the second of these two clips that I want to share. This is a more recent one, and this comes from an online debate that was held between the Eastern Orthodox internet philosopher Jay Dyer. I was thinking perhaps I should call Jay Dyer the popular Orthodox internet apologist, so it would be the P-O-I-A. Um, and he had a debate with Shabir Ali uh, uh, and this video, at least, was posted on June the 6th of 2020, so it's fairly recent. And the debate was on the topic, is Jesus God incarnate? And I was listening to this debate recently while I was doing some other things. And uh, I, they got to this one point where they were talking about uh, the deity of Christ. And they were talking about the Trinity. And uh, in the midst of this this debate, Shabir Ali, uh, I, I was interested to hear, drew upon James White as an ally in appealing to him as to why the coma ioannaeum, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, should be disregarded as a, re, a reliable source, scriptural source, um, undergirding the doctrine of the Trinity. So this is a, a, a briefer clip um, starting this at the 50 minute and 45 second mark. So here's Shabir Ali drawing upon James White uh, to uh, abandon the authority of 1 John 5, 7, and 8. 
this clear. To arrive at three, now you know that various people have arrived at different solutions to the idea that uh, Jesus is God. Some said uh, you, you, they use the term that you use, monarchianism, or at least scholars use that to denote the belief that the Father came down onto the earth and this was Jesus. Uh, so you, we cannot uh, use uh, unclear texts over and above the clear ones. I think this is a good principle. Even in my debate with Nabil Qureshi, Nabil Qureshi actually uh, admitted that. He agreed and he restated it himself that you cannot uh, use vague texts over uh, the uh, clear ones. Uh, now, the texts that say that uh, there is uh, this figure, angel of the Lord, um, this is vague. Uh, to begin with, it is not so clear that it should be the angel of the Lord. Because if I'll just give you some background. I, I started this maybe a little too early. But anyways, um, in part of the debate, Jay Dyer had mentioned uh, theophanies in the Old Testament and how uh, there were figures of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament that prefigured the incarnation of the second person of the Godhead, of, of the second, uh, the incarnation of Christ. And so here uh, Ali is trying to argue against the theophanies of the Old Testament as um, prefiguring the incarnation of Christ. Could be an angel. Uh, of the Lord. The, the text can go both ways. The, te the Septuagint, uh, the Greek version, sometimes gives it a definite article and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so we're not clear if God has one angel, several angels, and who are these angels? Uh, the angel of the Lord appears uh, in the New Testament as well, and sometimes it is clear there that it is also uh, to be translated as an angel uh, of the Lord. And uh, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 1, verse number 11, uh, there the angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah. And then in verse number 19, he says, I am the angel of the Lord. I am Gabriel. So uh, I, I don't believe that Christians take Gabriel to be uh, the third person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, so, uh, so if you say that the angel of the Lord automatically equates uh, with uh, the third person of the Holy Trinity, we have here an anomalous uh, text that needs to be explained. And there are several others as well. But even if you said that there is Yahweh in the Old Testament and he has his angels, so now everybody knows that there are two divine persons. There is Yahweh and there is Yahweh's angel, the angel of the Lord. But as I said, nobody was saying that. Nobody, nobody was declaring that, you know, there are two persons in the one God, the Father, and the angel of the Father. Nobody was saying that. So he's denying that that within the scope of the scriptures, there was never a declaration that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's follow his argument as he's going to get to uh, uh, 1 John 5, 7, 8, which, according to his argument, he must necessarily uh, negate this passage because this would undermine his whole argument There was that there was an explicit reference to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, within the, the Christian scriptures. Even in the presence of Jesus, nobody is saying that. Even on the words of Jesus, that we find nothing comparable. Uh, the, the closest we find to any declaration of this uh, unity uh, and diversity within the Godhead is 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, where it says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But this uh, is notoriously proven to be a later uh, insertion into the New Testament, uh, uh, many centuries after the New Testament was uh, completed, and eventually it found its way into the medieval texts and then was translated into the King James Version of the Bible. And okay, so he's going to attack this, right? It, this is late. It was, it was, it was added to the, to the copies much later. Of course, if you've listened to my presentation on the Coma Ioannaeum, that's untrue. We know of the antiquity of the Coma Ioannaeum. We know that it was uh, pervasive. Uh, that it was widely used. It was widely used um, in the medieval Christian tradition, uh, yes, but it has ancient roots. But of course, it's, it's um, integral to his argument to reject the Coma Ioannaeum. And now I notice that the Orthodox uh, Study Bible uh, also uh, retains the same tradition from the... Yes, it, isn't it interesting that not only do conservative Protestants uphold the Coma Ioannaeum, Ioanne Coma Ioannaeum, but even the Eastern Orthodox do. Even though they typically hold to the Byzantine or majority text, 
but even the Eastern Orthodox um, include the minority reading, 1 John 5, 7, and 8, as part of the canonical text of Scripture. The King James Version, by far. Of course, he, he's saying it came in through the King James Version, which is inaccurate. Um, of course, he follows the same line of many uh, modern evangelical apologists who seem to want to scapegoat and blame the King James Version. It's not a matter of the King James Version. It's a matter of the traditional text of the Bible uh, and including the flowering of that in the printed text of the Bible, the Texas Receptus. Following the Byzantine text uh, uh, or the majority text, which uh, others uh, like... Here he gets kind of confused and says that the, the, the coma is part of the majority or Byzantine text. It isn't. It's part of the Texas Receptus. But um, now he's going to go on to... Uh, pull out his Christian scholar who can support his opinion that the coma ioneum is spurious. Like James White, for example, uh, whom I've debated with several times, um, they, they declare this to be a later insertion into uh, the, the Bible. So we do not have any original statement uh, from uh, either the Old Testament or the New that would indicate that at one time people thought that there were two persons in the one Godhead. Uh, all right, I'll just stop there. So uh, here in a debate with Jay Dyer, Shabir Ali can gleefully appeal to a Christian apologist, James White, uh, to prove uh, his conclusion that uh, there are no texts within the Christian scriptures that ex explicitly affirm that God is uh, Father, Son, or Word, and Holy Spirit. So that's the second of the two clips that I wanted to share. So let's go back to the original question. Why do Muslim apologists love the modern critical text of the Bible, especially the modern critical text of the New Testament, and why do they love to appeal to those who promote it? Sadly, the answer is that they love the modern critical text and those who promote it because it fits their narrative of the Christian scriptures as being textually corrupted, hopelessly confused, and not providentially preserved by God. It is, in fact, only those who hold to the historical Protestant view of the Bible as kept pure in all ages who will be able to offer a meaningful apologetic to Muslims and other skeptics. And I might note that that we would uh, uh, we would say this is true that our apologetic is the best not just just because it's practical or pragmatic but also because it's true <laughs> it's true that god has preserved his word he has not let one jot or tittle of it be compromised we are living in some strange times as all of us know it is so sad to see the historical monuments being torn down. I live just an hour down the road or so from Richmond, Virginia, and the reports come in seemingly daily of uh, statues and monuments being vandalized and being torn down. It's so sad to see a complete lack of regard for the history, the traditions, the cultures that have uh, built our society. And I can add that it is equally sad to see a literary monument come under withering attack generation after generation since the 19th century um, and efforts being made to topple it. Now we can, we can watch and see a physical monument being torn down or being vandalized but sometimes it's a lot more difficult to perceive a literary monument being torn down, uh, being vandalized. As I've noted uh, on this podcast more than once, uh, such attacks upon the traditional texts of Scripture uh, seem to continue, but they also seem to continue to be resisted. And such attacks also seem to be frustrated by at least uh, a, a few, and I, I don't mean to minimize it, I, th I think it's actually a lot of cr ordinary Christians who continue to resist the attacks upon the traditional text of Scripture. 
to what can we attribute this tenacity of the traditional text of Scripture, which continues to be read in popular translations like the King James Version in, within English-speaking cultures, but it continues to be read in other popular Reformation-era translations in other cultures all over the world. Do we attribute the tenacity of the traditional text of Scripture to ignorance, the naivete of those who love it? Is it, is it that we hold to this text just because of threadbare tradition? Well, you might say perhaps that is true in some cases, but there is another explanation for this tenacity of the traditional text. Perhaps it continues to persist because it is the Word of God, because it is being providentially preserved. And if that is the case, we can have confidence that despite the attacks upon it, um, it will continue to persist. It will continue uh, to be used by God's people. It will continue to be acknowledged by God's people because it is the Word of God, and it will continue to be useful in giving to every man an answer, whether he is an atheist, whether he is an agnostic, whether he's a skeptic, whether he's a Mormon, whether he's a Muslim, it will continue to be useful in giving to every man an answer for the hope that is within us. Well, with that, I'm going to bring this episode of Word Magazine to a close. I hope this has been profitable and useful to those who are listening, and I will look forward to speaking to you in the next Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.